we're going to look at some multiple choice questions um, as we go through the rest of this chapter. And what I would encourage you to do is if you're following along with me for the next four examples, or really five, examples 10 through 14, try them on your own and then come back and watch this video. And I, I mention this because it's about to get a little rough, right? Like uh, now any of these methods and any of these formulas are fair game. So start practicing these on your own and see if we can start to get the feels, if you will, about, okay, does this problem sound like a Venn tree, table, counting, or is it formula only? And then once you identify that, see which formula it's going to get paired with. And it might be multiple, especially if it's a free response, but if it's a multiple choice, it'll probably be one over here and one over here. So in a moment, I'm gonna read example 10, and then I'm gonna talk about how we can eliminate some of these methods, and then we can really narrow down as to which method it is, and then which formula I need. Because those are gonna be the skills that you're gonna want moving forward. When you read a problem, which method am I on? Which formula do I want, okay? So let's take a look. So home pregnancy test kits have grown in popularity. Research shows that only 30% of those using a particular kit are actually pregnant. When a pregnant woman, woman uses this kit, it correctly indicates pregnancy 96% of the time. A woman who's not pregnant gets a correct indication 90% of the time. What is the probability that a woman is pregnant given that this test gives a positive result? All right, so if I take a step back here and I think about the women that are involved in this problem, I can hear two categorical variables. I can hear, are the women pregnant or not, right? So I wanna figure out, are you pregnant or not? And then do you get a positive test result? So that's what I hear going on. Two categorical variables, women are either pregnant, yes or no, and then they take a screening or a pregnancy test and they test positive or negative. So as I go through this, let's talk about the methods that you can rule out, okay? As soon as you see any words written on your paper, you are not in a formula only. So I could have ruled this one out real quick. That is not, not happening here. All right, I also could rule out the table method on site because I literally was not given a table. All right, I don't think this is counting. And actually it's not, it's not even that I don't think it, it's not, I wasn't given any information on frequencies. There's nothing in there about rolling a die. There's nothing in there about a deck of cards. All right, I'm not on any gambling kind of um, setup. Like there's no roulette, there's no blackjack, there's no, um, what's the other popular game that people play where you bluff? Why am I blanking on that? Poker, wow, okay. So there we go, so it's none of this. So usually with the word problems, it comes back down to, is it a Venn or a tree? And experience is gonna be the, the greatest helper for you in terms of which one is it. And I hope you can hear a tree because it sounds like there are two events happening one after the other in terms of either yes or no, you're pregnant, and then either yes or no, you test, or I should positive or negative, uh, you test positive or negative on the pregnancy test, right? Venn diagrams have words like, you know, 30% did this, 40% did this, and then 20% did both. All right, I don't see any of that kind of language in here, so I'm gonna go set up my tree diagram. Now you can have multiple branches on a tree diagram, but I'm gonna limit us in this, in this class just to two by twos. So I'm always gonna have, can we see all of this? Let me scooch this up just a bit so that we can all see it. Yeah, I think that's gonna be a good enough view screen. So when I say two by twos, okay, we're gonna have one set of branches with two outcomes, and then we're gonna tack on another set of branches here and another set of branches here. So ultimately we'll have four possible outcomes. All right, so I mentioned this in example nine, but it's really worth bringing up again. In terms of what event goes first, is it pregnant, not pregnant? or is it test positive, test negative? Like which set of events goes first? Examine the numbers you're given. You've got a 30%, you've got a 96%, and you've got a 90%, okay? So let's see what these numbers have to deal with. So this says 
of those using the kit are pregnant. So this number here is dealing with if you're actually pregnant, so pregnant, not pregnant. Okay, so I'll put here, I have one of my variables is are you pregnant, right? Pregnant or not. All right, and I've got one number that's dealing with whether or not this woman is pregnant. The other variable I can hear here, let me write variable, I'll write variable number two, is whether or not you test positive or negative. And give me a moment, I'll write this is variable number one. So I see I have one number dealing with variable number one, and let's look at these. It says when a woman is pregnant, I'm sorry, when a pregnant woman uses this kit, all right, there's a condition. They're telling us a pregnant woman uses the kit, and then we get a correct indication 96% of the time. So this is talking about whether or not you test positive or negative, correct indication. This is a woman who is not pregnant can get a correct indication 96% of the time. So both of these numbers are dealing with whether or not you uh, test positive or negative. So since I have two numbers dealing with testing positive or negative, I'm gonna put that on the second set of branches. Since I only have the one number about whether a woman's po uh, pregnant or not, I'm gonna put that on the first set of branches. So here we go, we got pregnant, and then we have its complement, not pregnant. Now for these two branches, their probabilities have to total out to 100%. They're complementary events. Any woman you talk to, I can put her into these, one of these two categories, pregnant or not pregnant. It says only 30% of those using a kit are actually pregnant. So I will put 30% here. Okay. By complement, maybe you're hearing that this has to be 70%, and maybe you're not there yet. And if you're not, use the complement rule. Let me clear all of this out. Let's go one minus 0.3, and we will see through the complement rule that we're looking at 70%. Okay. All right, so I'm continuing along with my tree diagram, and the next set of branches I need to do are the positives and negatives. So now I've got my two numbers. I'm gonna use them in these branches. I just gotta figure out where. It says, when a pregnant woman uses this kit. All right, so from that condition, when a pregnant woman, I'm, I'm already pushed along this branch. So I know I'm on this top branch. So for the pregnant women, it correctly indicates pregnancy 96% of the time. So if a woman's pregnant, the correct reading is the positive. So I'm gonna put that on 0.96. Now again, when a woman's pregnant, there will be times when she gets a negative test result. That happens. False negatives are a thing. Now, these have to be complementary events. So for all the women that are pregnant, they will either test positive or negative. So if we're along this condition, or along this branch, this still has to add up to 100%. If you're seeing what the decimal is, great. And if you're not there yet, no problem. Use the complement rule. So 4% of those pregnant women, right? You're hearing me, of the pregnant women, that's a condition. So 4% of these pregnant women will get a false reading, okay? All right, then here's our condition. A woman who is not pregnant gets a correct indication 90% of the time. So I'm along this branch, not pregnant. And you wanna be careful. To get a correct indication, I shouldn't be putting the 90% here. If it's a correct indication, the 90% goes on the negative sign, right? Because if you're not pregnant, you should get the 90%, I'm sorry, if you're not pregnant, you should get the negative reading on your pregnancy test. That is the correct indication, right? So correct on the bottom, correct up top, this up, down, right, or top, bottom, that's the false, um, excuse me, false negative. This one, the bottom top is the false positive. But still, we've got to figure out this number. We're going to use that complement rule again. So I'm going to do 1 minus 0.9, and I'm going to find out that number is 10%. Okay. So I've got my branches set up. Okay. So in terms of the method here, I know I'm on a tree diagram, but what we haven't figured out yet 
is do I need one of these formulas? All right. And, and I don't know, maybe I don't need any of them, but these are usually the formulas that I want to match up. Um, or the, usually the formulas I want to use. So let's see what the question actually says. Here we go. What is the probability that a woman is pregnant given that this test records a positive result? So there's a buzzword hanging out. I can see it, given that. Okay. So if I'm talking about given that, I need a conditional probability. Let me give myself some space here. So the probability that a woman is pregnant given she gets a positive test result, okay? So that is the probability I'm being asked to calculate. When I go back over to my formulas, which formula am I gonna use? I'm gonna be using formula number two. And please don't use formula three, all right? We don't know that these events are independent, so you can't use it, all right? But I, I can use this. So we had pregnant given positive. So I'm gonna go pregnant and positive over the probability of positive. I'm gonna swap out A with pregnant, B with positive, and then we're gonna crunch some numbers. All right, so let me get all of that written down. So this is gonna be the probability of pregnant and positive over the probability of positive. Okay, great. Okay. So for pregnant and positive, if we remember back from just the previous page, if we're talking about ands and you're on a tree diagram, you wanna multiply your particular branches. So pregnant and positive, that means I'm gonna to go top, top. So I'm gonna go along this branch here. So I'm gonna go 0 0.30 times 0 0.96. That is my numerator. All right, the probability that I test positive. Well, these positives are back on the second set of branches, and you can see there's two positive symbols, which means there's two branches I wanna take care of. All right, because there's two ways to test positive. You could be pregnant and test positive, or you could not be pregnant and test positive. But keep in mind, these are disjoint events. You can't be pregnant and test positive and not pregnant and test positive at the same time. You're in one of these two categories. You can't be both at the same time. So what I wanna do is I wanna multiply along the particular branches. I wanna find these products, 0.3 times 0.96 and 0.7 times 0.10, but I wanna add the disjoint branches. So on the denominator, we'll have 0.3 times 0.96 plus it looks like 0.7 times 0.10. And maybe you starting to see a pattern with between examples nine and 10, but basically whatever's on the numerator here, it also shows up on the denominator plus whatever extra branch you might have, okay? All right, so at this point, I just wanna be careful with how I multiply things. So I'm gonna do numerator first, so 0.3 times 0.96, and it looks like the numerator is 0.288. Okay, and then I'm going to add to that 0.7 times 0.1. So it looks like my denominator is 0.358. And when I do that ratio, I am getting about 0.804. And again, if, if you want to, you can do all of this together. I just, I, I would recommend putting parentheses around both the numerators and denominators to make sure you don't leave anything off. And there it is, 0.804. So either way I can get that number. So that's good. Now let's take a look at the answers we have in our, our multiple choice um, options. So I have about, here it is, C. I have about 80% going on right there, okay? So again, if a woman tests positive, about 80% of the time she's actually pregnant. So we've got about 20% of the women who, testing po who test positive are actually getting false readings. All right, but if I was looking through all of this, positive, given I tested positive, what was the likelihood I was pregnant, with both of these numbers being pretty darn high, um, I would probably just, through intuition, rule out E and D, okay? 
those would probably be the ones I, I, if I wasn't sure that I wouldn't guess those numbers. And I probably wouldn't guess 96% of the time because that seems pretty high. But my educated guess might be between B and C if I wasn't even doing any of the math. Okay. All right. So with that, in that multiple choice option, all right, our combo, for example, 10 was tree diagram mixed with formula two. All right. So the tree diagram method, and then we had formula two. All right. So let's read example 11. And then again, I want you to try and listen for what type of problem is this? Because we want to figure out the type and then we want to figure out what formula we might be using, keeping in mind that we might not be using any formula at all. It just depends on the wording of the problem. So it says out of 40 students, 14 are taking English composition and 29 are taking chemistry. Okay, so out of 40 students, 14 are taking comp, 29 taking chemistry. It says if five students are taking, or excuse me, if five students are in both classes, what is the probability that a student is in neither? All right, so when I hear that kind of word problem, let's talk about what method we might be using. Anytime you have a word problem, you can give the boot to formula only. This is not a formula only. All right, I can also get rid of table because I quite literally do not have a table of information. It could potentially be a counting problem. They did give us some frequencies in there. But if you hear the words of it, right, it's a Venn diagram. We have some taking English, some taking chem, some taking both. That is, is the formula, or I shouldn't say formula, that's the setup for a Venn diagram. So I know I'm gonna be dealing with a Venn diagram, and then we'll see if they're gonna ask me to use any of these formulas as we move along A through C. So the first thing I'm gonna do is draw a Venn diagram. And I'm gonna have my circles overlap because they said right here that five are taking both. If I had that there were no students taking both, I would leave it as just two separate circles that didn't overlap. Those would be disjoint circles or disjoint events. All right, here we go. So let me put two circles or two ovals in here. Okay, so I will just call the first one, we'll, I'll say E for English and then C for chemistry. That seems to be an okay um, set of abbreviations. Now, whenever this is starting out, I want to start with the football. So it said five students are in both classes. Okay, so I'm going to put five in the football. And I wanna show you the most common error. I, I always get this. I get students will tell me 14 here and then 29 here, all right? So I get that every single time and then students don't quite understand why they're wrong. So let's, let's evaluate this. If your initial hunch was to put 14 here and 29 here, it's wrong, which is fine. We just gotta fix it, right? We're not there yet and we don't have to be there yet. So let me erase this and erase this. And let's start to think about why putting a 14 here and a 29 here is incorrect. Um, and just if I, let me, let me put this in one more time. If I put 14 and 29 here, um, actually what will that add up to 29? Hold on. Let me see if this is a different way to light up an error. Yeah, it is great. Just wanted to make sure. So if you put the 14 and the 29 here, if you added these three numbers up, in this case, you can see um, you get 48 students total and they had a limit of 40. So that would be an indicator that you were wrong. The reason that I was hesitant to do this is because there are problems depending on how large the, the class size is. Like if there had been 70 students, you wouldn't have seen the error just by adding this up. But because this happens to total out to a number larger than the total number of students, you can see there's an error happening. So let me go back. And let me erase this. So again, it is not 14 and it is not 29. Okay, so it says 14 are taking English. So I want to remind us of our Venn diagram. 
when we're talking about the folks taking English, it's this entire circle. So not just the left moon, but the left moon and the football. So we've got to remember this entire circle needs to add up to 14. So if I already have five students here and the entire circle needs to add up to 14, then nine students must be going there. And where am I getting nine? I will take my, my entire event space of 14. I will subtract out the five students I already know about, and that would be nine. So this is how we indicate that 14 students in general are taking English comp. Nine of them are only taking English comp and not chemistry. Five of the ones that are taking English comp are also taking chemistry, right? There's some overlap. So by that same idea, we have 29 students here taking chemistry. I can't put 29 here. I need the entire circle to add up to 29. So I will take my event space of 29, I will subtract out five, and I will find out that 24 students are actually taking only chemistry. So these 24 just taking chemistry, right? These five are taking chemistry and English comp. Okay, so with that, let's take a look at what these three numbers add up to because we always need to figure out the neithers, right? Because we have both, just one, just the other, or neither. There's always four categories here. All right, so let's figure this out. We've got nine plus five plus 24, excuse me, and we've got 38, and it told us that there were 40 students, right? So if I take 40 and I subtract the 38 I've already accounted for, there are two students out here that are doing neither. All right, so those two students, they're not taking English com, they're not taking chem, okay, no problem, they're taking neither. So with any of these categories, right, we have just taking English, taking both, just taking chemistry, taking neither. Okay, so just one, just the other, both, neither. No problem. All right, so now let's start to pick apart this, this thing. It says if five students are in both classes, what is the probability that a student is in neither? So I see that buzzword of probability. Okay, I'm going to put P with some stuff in the middle. Now you could write the word neither, but because I'm the math teacher, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna use um, complementary language. So I'm gonna put E complement and C complement, right? I'm not taking English and I'm also not taking chemistry. I'm taking neither. And if it's probability, don't give me this as your answer. The answer is not just two. Every probability that you ever calculate for me is a number between zero and one, or specifically a decimal between zero and one. So what do I need to divide two by? I need to divide by the sample size. Whenever you wanna turn a frequency into a relative frequency, divide by sample size. Or if you ever wanna turn a frequency into a probability, divide by sample size. So this is actually two divided by 40, and when I crunch that on my calculator, we should be getting, let's see, about 5%. Okay. All right, so let's move on to part B. This says how many students are in at most one class. Now, take a look at this, how many students. And before I actually say it out loud, I want you to think, is this asking you for a frequency or a relative frequency? When they say how many students? This question is asking us for a frequency. This one, part B wants a whole number, whereas part A wanted a decimal. So we wanna pay attention to just what is actually being asked of us. So we need to figure out how many students are taking at most one, one class. And I talked about at most earlier, but it's, it's really worth repeating, at most, if you ever hear that phrase, that's like saying the symbol less than or equal to, okay? And if you ever hear at least, that's synonymous with the, the symbol greater than or equal to, all right? So we struggle with this sometimes because you hear the phrase most and you might think greater than, but it's not. It's actually the flip of it. It's less than or equal to. And when you hear least, you might think less than, but it's not. It's greater than or equal to. So it's counterintuitive. All right, so as we start to go through this, at most one class. So you basically, in any Venn diagram, you have four parts. One, both, the other, or neither. 
So if I am taking at most one class, let's let's break this down. At oops, at most one class. All right, then how many classes could I be taking? This is like saying you are taking less than or equal to one class. All right, and what numbers are less than or equal to one? All right, so the most a student could be taking was two classes, right? So students are either taking, you have three options, zero classes, one classes, or two classes, right? Those are your three options. And if I want less than or equal to one, I want the folks that are taking zero classes or one class. So let's see if we can figure this out. I'm gonna put my pencil in the four areas of the Venn diagram and we're gonna see if those folks fit into what I'm looking for. So these students here, these nine students, are they taking at most one class? Well, let's think about it. These nine, they are taking English and they're not taking chemistry. So is they are taking one class. These nine folks are taking one class. I wanna count them in my numbers. So I wanna use them, right? Let's talk to these five folks. How many classes are these five, five folks taking? They are taking two classes. I do not want to include them in my overall count. All right, because if you're taking two classes, you are not taking at most one class. All right, what about these 24 students? These 24 students are taking one class. Okay, I would like to include them in my count. And then finally, what about these two students? These two students are taking zero classes. So I would like to include them in my count also. And when I do nine, plus four plus two, I'm looking at 35 and the units would be students. So what typically happens when I, I have students try part B is they tell me to just add nine and 24. So they tell them to tell me that 33 students is the answer. So let me just tell you, I, I usually get the incorrect answer for part B. is 33 students. And the, the confusion here is the phrase at most one. So at most one is less than or equal to one class. So zero or one classes. If we wanna compare and contrast that, these three students are taking exactly one class. Right? And that's, that's just a different type of question. So we've got 35 students taking at most one class whereas we have 33 students taking exactly one class. And the thing is, if you're taking at most one, we wanna add the folks that are taking zero, okay? All right, so we got that one. The next one says, what is the okay, probability that a randomly chosen student from this group is taking only the chemistry class? So we see only chem. Now also, I want a probability. So if you're taking only chem, that means you're taking chem but not English. So I've got probability, I've got some P, all right, or I've got the letter P with some stuff that I wanna put in the middle. Now you could write the words taking only chemistry. That's fine. But like I said, I'm a math teacher, so I gotta use the math symbols. If I'm taking only chemistry, I wanna do English complement and chemistry, right? Because I am not taking English, but I am taking chemistry. So those are the students I wanna pay attention to. And that's talking about this right moon here. So I'm gonna do 24. And again, 24 is not my final answer. All right, if I'm thinking 24, that's fine, but that's a frequency. They asked me for a probability. So I need to do 24 divided by 40. Let's see what that number is. And I am looking at about 60%. So we had probability for part A, a probability for part C, and a frequency for part B. So again, just being careful to answer what is asked of you, okay? Now before we end this one, I just wanna show you the relationship between a Venn diagram and a table. So we haven't done a table in a little while, but I wanna show you how you can map a Venn diagram to a table. So I'm just gonna kind of, I'll, I'll put it in over here on the side. Let me make sure we have enough room to see that. So I'll put that over here, okay.
Okay, so let me make a table. And then again, like always, I'm just gonna section this off. Okay, and I'm, it's gonna be a two by two table. So not my greatest table, but that is all right. Okay, so let me get my categorical variables on here. So I am going to put um, taking English here. Okay, and I'll put yes, no. And over here, we're gonna do taking chem. And I will put the answers of yes, or no, because those are basically the two categorical variables that we were choosing between in this problem. So I wanna show you where these four numbers go with respect to this table, all right? And I, I always think it's easier to start with the football. So the five, right? These five folks, all right. Were they taking English? I would be in this column, yes, right? Were they taking chem? I would be in this row, yes. So these five students go here, where I'm taking both English and chemistry. So I can map that number five onto my, um, from my Venn diagram onto my table. I think the next easiest one is actually to do the neithers. All right? I like to do the extreme ones first. So five were taking both, two were taking neither. So if you're taking neither, it means you're not taking chemistry and you are also not taking English. So those two students are gonna go over there. Okay, great. All right, so then, what I have to figure out is where do the rest of these go? So let's think about these nine folks. They are taking English and they are not taking chemistry. So under English, they're under the yeses, right? I would be in this column, but they are not taking chemistry, so I would be in this row, so the nine students go over there. Right? Let's think about these 24 students. These 24 students are taking chemistry, but they are not taking English. So in terms of taking chemistry, they're on this row, but they are not taking English, so they're in this column. There we go. So I have taken my Venn diagram, which has its four parts, taking one, taking the other, taking both or neither, and I have mapped them into a table, taking both, taking neither, taking one, taking the other. Right? And you can make that mapping, and we could even go to a tree diagram if we wanted to, but I'm just gonna show you the mapping from the Venn to the table for right now. All right, so we're gonna try two more multiple choice questions.